Well, hey guys, Nate here. Very happy to have Bob Bergman with us today. Bob ran the Postville Blacksmith Shop. He he knows everything about blacksmithing in the U.S. over the last hundred years. He met most of the big figures. He studied under them, Francis Whitaker and uh, Clifton Ralph, I believe. He he studied and, and was in Europe learning blacksmithing. He is the real deal. And to this day, he continues to promote and be really a figurehead uh, for the trade. So we've got my dad here with us as well, who's actually doing most of the interview here. He has known Bob for a long time, and Bob helped him with his power hammer back in the day. So he was really excited to get on this, this call with him. Unfortunately, the first interview we did kind of failed due to tech reasons. And in that conversation, Bob went into more detail about his career and how he got into blacksmithing. But I'll give you the quick version. He didn't start there. He started in New York in advertising. And he just he really explains this uh, neat series of events and thought processes that kind of got him uh, wanting to get away from that world. And he ended up uh, blacksmithing, and we're all better off for it. So we will probably circle back with him and, and cover some of that material again because it, it was really interesting and valuable, especially for people who are maybe not satisfied in a career. Uh, so without any further ado, here is Bob Bergman and my dad primarily talking about blacksmithing, the big figures in blacksmithing, and they also cover sawmilling. So if you're not into blacksmithing, don't worry, there's plenty of conversation here about lumber. Bob ran a sawmill for a while, and uh, so these two guys have a lot of overlap. They are kindred spirits, and I'm very happy to share this conversation with you. Well, uh, you and my dad have a lot of a lot in common, a lot of overlap, although different parts of the world. And we've got a bunch of um, questions on shared uh, passions and hobbies and businesses. But I've I w I have already given the viewers an overview of your big picture career in terms of blacksmithing and such. But I guess maybe the first question: um, Are you still blacksmithing regularly? Are you still um, is it is it a part of your day to day? And then, Dad, why don't you jump in and kind of talk about this, you know, this. Sure. This good deal. Good, good. Uh, no, it is not. I mean, I still am interested. I still watch YouTube videos. I still keep up with my blacksmith friends. But um, I'm doing much more woodworking now. And what my wife says is, they used to call me rusty. Now they call me dusty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on. Yeah. So, so man glitter is a real thing, right? And I'm sitting here in a black sweatshirt that is covered with spruce sawdust right now. So I get that for sure. <laughs> but uh, so, so let me, what I, what I would really like to do as we start this conversation is sort of let the people who are listening know how you and I became acquainted and, and it sort of illustrates what your uh, impact as a blacksmith over the last what has it been 40 years now 50 years right for me yes 52 years 52 yeah. years yeah. so after 52 years in this what your impact was now like 17 years ago when I had um, I had just bought at auction a 200 pound Chambersburg general utility hammer and people can see it on some of our videos it was the first video that nate thought we ought to make on the channel was about that power hammer and but the backstory on that was that when that showed up in my shop i think in 2006 or 2007 i knew uh i didn't just know nothing about it i didn't know anything about what i didn't know about it even it was just a complete vacuum of information for me and i went to i think my second northwest blacksmith association conference and i identified grant sarver off Center Forge, now departed, too young. But he was the big dog in the Pacific Northwest for tool making, right? Grant had a real interest and passion and was developing, a, I think, a pretty good business making tools from Off Center Forge. And so I sort of approached him with my hat in my hand at this blacksmith conference. And, you know, I was hesitant to bother him, but he was personable. And I said, hey, I bought this hammer. Oh, those, uh, those, uh, those are good hammers. So general utility hammers are good hammers. So that I got that endorsement. And I said, yeah, but the problem is I don't have any air to it yet. And I don't know how much air it will take. And I don't have the, and so he said, well, 
He said, I think it'll probably take about 100 CFM, but you need to call Bob. I said, Bob, yes, Bob Bergman at the Postville Blacksmith Shop. Talk to him. He'll tell you. And so I got on Anvil Fire and I sort of sniffed around and, and uh, ferreted out the phone number for the Postville Blacksmith Shop and called. And I think I talked, I don't know who it was. It was, it was essentially a secretary or someone. And, and, and she, I believe, said, yeah, Bob will call you back, I think is how it went. And sure enough, you called me back. And I said, well, I've got this, this general utility hammer. And you told me that you had had one. And you gave me sort of a little rundown on controllability and stuff. And I said, so how much air do I need? How? And you told me. And uh, it was the right answer. And then a few weeks later, I think once I got air to it, I followed up with another phone call and you sold me at a nice price, an oiler to go on there that you just happened to have in stock, a very fair price for less money than I would end up paying for a, an operations manual on the internet. And then you ended up giving me one of those also. So that's how far your reputation had expanded. And, and uh, for everyone who's listening, I want you to know that Bob's a generous man with his time and his knowledge. And I'm going to assert something now that you will probably protest. And it's this. I know that you spent some time with Francis Whitaker. Okay. He was arguably the big dog of the Renaissance, the, the revival of blacksmithing. Well, whether you know it or not, you kind of occupy Francis Whitaker's space now, Bob. I don't know if oh. you've ever contemplated that. No, and I'm, I, no, I'm not, no. I'm not drawing, I, I'm not putting an equal sign there, but I'm just saying that in the blacksmithing world, in a lot of ways that includes the internet and these other things, the space you occupy is not vastly different. Uh, I appreciate the comment. I, I disagree, but uh, I was lucky. I had good mentors. And as time went by and people started asking me questions, I feel like it was my op obligation to be a mentor to younger people that, you know, it's just part of the, the continuity of the trade that, that just what you do. Yeah. Um, I would say I would be more in the footsteps of Clifton Ralph okay. than Francis. Okay. Um, Francis was an, a unique individual and was a very serious individual. Uh, I like, I'm a little more fun loving, I think, than Francis. <laughs> um, that's a, that's quite a, quite a, a comment. I, and I appreciate that. Somebody else told me something along those lines of there's a tree of knowledge and I'm, I'm a branch. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, you know, it, it's easy to sort of pull back from something like that. Right. Because um, so my mother-in-law has on her wall, a, a, a Gaelic um, blessing and it's goes like this and I won't get the pronunciation anywhere near right, but of, of all the gifts, the gifty could give us, to see ourselves as others see us. And uh, so just for what it's worth, when people think of places to go to get an answer or see a technique or, or get, a, get an innovation, um, we tend to think of uh, Postville Blacksmith Shop and at least for now, Bob Bergman. And so right. anyhow, oh, so thank thanks. thank you for that. And sorry about making you squirm. Well, Let, let's talk what about, I, what go I, ahead. What I realized uh, about power hammers was they're essential. Yeah. Francis had a minimal use of power hammers. He had a 25 pound little giant and that was it. Oh my. Um, and how he was able to make a living uh, with the limited amount of, of machinery and equipment he had was by being at the right place at the right time. Uh. He was running a shop in Aspen, Colorado where architecturally blacksmithing was in high demand uh, and like I say, he was a very serious man, very well educated, uh, very well spoken. He could present himself to these millionaires and billionaires who were building lodges in Colorado and in, in such a way that they would take their hat off when they saw him and say, you know, good morning, Mr. Whitaker. Yes, sir, mm. Mr. Whitaker. He had a lot of authority. Mm. And as a result, uh, pricing his work was inconsequential especially as he got older, where people thought, I, he, you know, he's not going to be here forever. Uh, I, I want my fire set or my fireplace uh, screen or my, my gate now. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to uh, 
rock this guy at all, you know, and uh, so he had a kind of a, a different situation uh, in Aspen. Sure. sure. I live out in the middle of nowhere. Sure. Yeah. What uh, about his personality uh, made him like that? What 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 was his charisma like that allowed or put people um, gave them that feeling from him? All right. He came from a family. His father was an editor of a magazine, which was similar to today's Architectural Digest. Oh, my. When Francis was a young man getting ready to go to college, his father said, I will either send you to college or I will teach you, uh, allow you to, to learn a trade. And Francis chose to, be, to, to learn the trade. He was sent to Europe. He worked with the uh, extremely famous Smiths there, a guy named Julius Schramm. Uh, returned to the United States. Well, okay, give me a, a, a good story from the, the European days. Um, uh, came to a shop. I think he might have spoken German. So he had, you know, some Advantage. skills, but basically was not coming out of a trade background. And uh, typically the first thing you do when you were a young man in an old time blacksmith shop is you run the sledgehammer. Mm hmm and uh, he was on the opposite side of the anvil from the smith and hammered, hammered, hammered. And at the end of the day, his hands had frozen up <laughs> to where he, they had to pry his fingers off of the shaft of the, of the sledge. And at that point, he was accepted into the shop because of his <laughs> determination. Uh, and that's a great the, story. Well, Scott, story. did you ever hear, there's another story about, you know, how, how was a young blacksmith uh, comes into a shop and the uh, first thing the, the smith does, he gives him a hacksaw and he asks him to saw a railroad, piece of railroad <laughs> back in half. And uh, about two days later, the chunk <laughs> falls off on the floor and uh, the young man says to his master, well, what is, what was that for? He says, that's to see if you had the determination to make it. You're hired, kid. You're hired. <laughs> that's a great story. Yeah. Oh, that's a great story. So it so Francis so has left. Anyway, Go ahead. he was he was educated. He was and, educated. All right. And 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 after he he came back to the States, he worked at the Yellen shop. He worked at the Yellen shop under oh, Samuel yeah. Yellen's. Oh, wow. Yeah. On uh, one of the projects was uh, the gates for the Federal Reserve Building. Oh, okay, I have and seen a picture of those monumental gates. They're project. 20 feet tall, right? Yeah, and you know, this was a time where the Ellen shop was probably 40, 60 people, maybe more. Yeah. Uh, people who were extremely well-trained. It was just a, you know, a fabulous place for him to come. Uh, then he left and then comes the depression. And things got pretty, he moved to California. And I don't, I don't recall where his family was from originally, but the, he moved to California. And there, fortunately, also, there was a, a market for Spanish style work. And mm -hmm. he did that, but he also learned how to weld. And something that he did not promote a lot but was a, a, a fact was he was an extremely good welder. He didn't uh -huh. want people to weld and, you know, in sure. his class, you know, sure. it was all fire welding, Sure. but uh, he, he taught welding, especially during world war two. Uh -huh. And, you know, basically he, he retained the knowledge in the real big downturn of the trade yes. and happened to be in California where he got work. Uh, there was, uh, a builder who was building sort of fancy subdivisions on the coast and they were Spanish style and had lots of uh, iron work and, and he was a sharp guy. Um, he made a lot of money in real estate. He lived in Carmel, California. Uh, somebody asked him if he wanted to get in on a land deal on a property that had been a farm that they stripped the black dirt off and sold. So it was a oh. really, rough terrible piece of property well you know 20 years later that was a multi turned into a multi-million dollar piece of property he moved to aspen oh my uh, in aspen he uh it was kind of like a, a tired old mining town this is mm -hmm. he moved to aspen uh before the the lifts were there wow and uh he was instrumental in helping to build the first ski lifts 
Boy, you it's know, like you said, it's like you said, there is no substitute for being in the right place at the right time, <laughs> is there? He, he, he uh, came up with a uh, uh, ski safety binding that was a competitor to what became sort of state of the art. Uh, he, his patent was bought out to, to keep him out of the market. So he made more money. Uh, he had a, a corner piece of property in what came to be downtown Aspen, right at the foot of the ski hill. And uh, that got sold and turned into a fancy restaurant, the Forge restaurant, made more money, uh, married a, in his second marriage, a very, uh, very fun and uh, lively woman named Portia, Portia Whitaker. And she had a lot of money. So it wasn't all blacksmithing. But the point is that he uh, could talk to people about the news. He could talk to people about history. He could talk to people about architecture, opera. Uh, Investment. Very cultured, dignified man with a fantastic vocabulary and a kind of a deep voice and, a, and a, just a, a stark look to him i mean tall lean um these deep blue eyes that were very penetrating i mean if you were one of his students and did something wrong and he gave you the stare you you knew you felt it you, you, you felt you it felt the rays coming out <laughs> at you. Yeah. okay so, so so maybe my comparison was not quite right but okay so clifton ralph that probably is a very apt comparison well uh yes other okay, than... just a second. Let's give our people some background on this so we're, they're not getting a story in a vacuum. So Clifton Ralph, so Francis Whitaker presided over the renaissance of blacksmithing from the time arc welding and lathes made it irrelevant until the time it was, it, it reemerged, right? Late 60s, early 70s in the domain of artists first and then sort of more into the general populace. Yes, he was discovered by Jim Wallace and introduced to Abana. Okay. All right. And that that in 1976 there was an Abana conference in Carbondale, Illinois, and Francis was so swarmed by people oh. after watching his demonstrations. He he told me that you were asking him questions, asking him questions. He said he'd go into the bathroom and take a leak, and people are standing next to him at the urinal asking him <laughs> questions. You know, he just could, and that's when he recognized that there was a, a real hunger for his knowledge. And he became acquainted with the John C. Campbell Folk School and used that as a home base to teach. And then through that would invite certain students out to his uh, shop in Aspen to work with him. Including you had to go to the folk school first. Including you at one point. Yes. Okay. All right. So then Clifton Ralph. Clifton Ralph was uh, one of the last men standing from the real industrial blacksmith age. Is that overstating it? Yes. Okay, fair he, enough. He, there were, he had a lot of people that were, you know, from the mills and were in the union and, you know, people that I met down in Gary. It was, it's still going now, Scott. I mean, it's okay. not the, you know, the industrial blacksmithing had a much uh, more uh, continuous uh, run than, than the ornamental. Sure. But where Clifton, but Clifton similarly got discovered, I believe Jack Brubaker discovered him. Um and uh, same kind of story got brought to some conference and people re- recognized that he was he he was a master craftsman and, okay. and a very okay. smart man uh, mathematically um, uh, just he, he he played the hillbilly role to the sure. max but underneath it he he was a near genius level intellect um and the the difference between he and francis um clifton learned in the mills where it was pretty rough and tumble Uh and there was a lot of displaced people from world war ii who are now working in the mills europeans and they're most of them uh you know you didn't tell people your secrets you kind of turned around and you know when you're doing something tricky you kind of got in between the, the guy who was watching and you know you put your back to him um and and there was lots of teasing and testing uh that went on jokes that you know joking around that was a little more Hard. than that i mean it was Hard. hazing it became be hazing 
Yeah. Yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. So. so that's the way Clifton came across compared to Francis being such a gentleman. And he also smoked real heavy. I'm guessing three packs of cigarettes a day. Mm-hmm. He always had a cigarette. And the sort of guy who could smoke a cigarette, so there'd be about a two inch long piece of ash hanging off the end. Oh yeah. And 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 in your face, he was hard of hearing. And I mean, it was tough. I mean, and quite intimidating. Interesting. Uh, first of all, it's hard to catch your breath when you're in, in, in close and he's hard of hearing. So he'd be right up in your face and jabbing you and poking you and 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 often just covered with grease. He, he had a hundred pound little giant and his theory was these things live on grease and his machine was really greasy. So by the time you got done with a meeting with him, you'd have like this black stripe around your midriff from him poking at you and getting right in your face and you know huh, huh, huh. With, with, with cigarette ashes glued to the cigarette grease even better yeah. yeah yeah i can remember the first time i i met him um drove got a through a phone call with him uh asking if i could come down for a visit gary's about gary indiana is about four hours from here and uh talking to him on the phone was not easy because of yeah. his hearing situation Anyway, I got an authorization to come down, get down there. And Gary was a lot of uh, small properties. Uh, his lot was, let's say, 150 by 450. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these people had come up from the South, World War II era, got jobs in the mills and the factories. And they often had chickens and you know, a cow in the, in the, in the little barn on the property and, you know, go to work at the mills, but they kind of brought the old world with them. They were the mm-hmm. Appalachian world with them. Mm-hmm. So I get into this, this house is probably uh, 30 by 30, one story house and a garage behind it. It's in that same size, dark, sun late afternoon sun coming in haze of Of smoke cigarette smoke dark to where it took a while to adjust to look and see what was there and it was really minimal Mm -hmm. he had this power hammer he had a pedestal grinder uh 12 by 2 wheel no guards Mm -hmm. um uh lincoln buzz box welder and lots and lots of tongs and boxes and boxes of chunks of steel that had kind of a, a loop handle on them that were quite mysterious. And uh, did you ever see the book, Scott, um, Blacksmith's Blacksmith Practice Illustrated by Lilico? No, no, uh, Lilico was a, a railroad blacksmith uh-huh. and in his book. They show how to make like a crank arm for a locomotive or. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, different little pieces. Well, what it was, he showed in the book how to figure out what is this piece going to weigh? Uh-huh. And what's the largest dimension of it? And then he would cut, you know, cut a piece of steel that had the tallest inches not that you needed and the right amount of weight and there there were two uh, forging mantras given to me one was isolate separate forge to finish dimension that was ta- taught by a guy in the west coast industrial guy art jones that means you fuller into a piece isolate the parts that are going to remain, the parts that are going to be stretched and 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 reduced, and forged to finish side. Uh, France um, Clifton's uh, mantra was VARF, volume, area, resistance, force. That any forging could be explained in those uh, four, four terms. Terms, okay. Clifton uh, established himself as as. Uh, competent he was a good teacher uh any question asked he could do he could make right first shot out of the box you know no 
trial. He, he just had a lot of unconscious knowledge. He was mm -hmm. very, very competent. And he ran into a guy who was the head of uh, the Metallurgical Society in the United States, uh, a guy named... Uh, he had a place in, in Tennessee. It'll, his name will come to me eventually. Uh, who was an Abana member, Abana board member. And he set up a teaching facility for Clifton. Oh. Somehow or another, this guy had come out of the um, uh, hills of Kentucky and also, you know, worked his way up the ladder, except he became a manager Anyway, we'll so the these guys got along great, and Clifton had a facility to teach, and um, same sort of thing. Like with Francis, you you kind of had to go to school first before you would, you know, really open up to you. Had to cut off the railroad iron first. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And you know, when I was there, there were uh, um, some people who had quite a bit of experience. One guy was a colonel in the in the army, and Clifton kind of gave him this poking, testing you know, uh, hazing thing. And you can tell this guy was not used to this at all. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. But, anyway, that was, uh, and, and, and so and Clifton became, Clifton became a good friend. I had never worked in a factory. Right. I had never had the industrial background. So when you say that I follow him, what I did was I got the knowledge from him and then was asked to demonstrate and teach at the folk school and at local conferences, but I did it without the poking, yes, the spitting on people, yes. the cigarette smoke in their face. Sure. So that was my branch. Sure. And sure. I, I picked up a few things on my own also, and I took that industrial work or that industrial uh, forging style and applied it to ornamental work. And See, the reason so, being compared to Francis, where he had this market that he could work by hand and people would pay him. I had to really kind of pick up the production, the, yeah. you know, the productivity and that's where the power hammer or whatever it took, you know, uh, a forging press or whatever. That was my style was to take industrial tools and techniques and apply them to ornamental uh, iron. So, so that's very interesting um, because there's a market and there's a person and, and there's a, there's a type, there's a mentality that values the romance and the sentimentality and the um, they value that like there are people who only do woodworking with hand tools, right? They, they just, that's their thing. And there are people who will turn out exactly the same product with more modern or very modern or cutting edge modern tools. And at the end of the day, you can't really tell the difference between the pieces and yet the people, there are some people who value that the laboriousness of doing things there, there by are some hand. People, there are some people, Scott, I agree. But on these bigger projects, bigger house projects, people building multi-million dollar houses, these people don't get rich by throwing their money away. They That's want true. value. That's they true. want value. And, and there's a flip side to that, that there are some people who can't buy your work if they can't brag about how much it costs them. Uh, I didn't run into any of those, unfortunately. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't run into, I didn't run into enough to make a living at it. But uh, at, at one of the conferences I went at, in fact, it might've been the same conference. There was a guy, Wendell, somebody from Texas. Wendell uh, Broussard. That's him. Yeah. Very agreeable guy. And he gave me a yeah, couple yeah. of, he, he gave me a couple of um, recommendations about, blacksmithing business and i'll remember them oh, here in a minute oh, look, i got it bill manley okay <laughs> that's the guy in tennessee bill okay. manley all right fair Very enough. Nice. <laughs> so, so so one of the things that that uh, broussard told me was to network with every blacksmith that i possibly could don't view them as competitors but view them as as uh team members because you're going to have something that comes along your way that is not you're either too busy to take or it's not in your skill set you need to have people that can pick up your slack and that you can pick up slack for but in his, I think it was his video presentation of slides, he showed a stairway that he did. And uh, the person that he built it for, uh, Bannister, big. You, you're looking up this, 
this stairwell and the banister goes up and turns and turns and turns and it's you know the focal point is way up there and the and it's getting smaller and it, it's just one of those and it was iron and bronze and gold leaf and just about as you know acanthus leaves every place you could look and and sort of french rococo rococo i don't know how it's pronounced sort of a a, a feel and he said that he had a non-disclosure agreement with this person that he couldn't tell anybody who it was for or where it was at, but he could tell people that that, that railing cost $10,000 a lineal foot. And, uh, you know, that, so I sort of, I think that sort of uh, validates my assertion. There are people who get their satisfaction out of bragging about the value of what, the, of the cost of what they have that just can't patronize you unless it, it costs it. Like Francis Whitaker had people like that. They had to be able to brag about what that handwork piece cost them. What you I think? found... Well, we, we worked on a project, our, our shop worked on a project that Wendell and um, Joe Pahosky worked on. Ah. Uh, this was a 44,000 square foot log structure in Colorado. Oh, my. And that place was the, the non-disclosure place. And uh, what I found is those homeowners don't want to talk to the blacksmith. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. You know? Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? So uh it was it was a great job uh they they were personable in that uh when we went out to install this man's wife um set us up to go out and eat at the fanciest restaurant in town and paid for it and um they allowed us to take some pictures for personal use but not to use as promotional so yeah yeah but that that was that was in our last conversation. I told you about the golden years in yes. the nineties for us and how it just was more and more and more. And it seemed like it was never going to end until it ended. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the projects in the nineties that we worked on in, in that Southwestern Colorado. That's a big Virginia time project, area. man. That's a yeah. big time project. It was I, w One of the things that Wendell told me, I, I think I asked him what sort of a niche would you pursue if you were starting now? And I think he told me he would pursue um, window, um, hardware for windows and, um, perhaps cabinets, a very high end, highly finished hardware. He thought he might pursue that. That was one of the other pieces of advice he gave to me, but you were right that, um, the contrast now in the blacksmith community between share what, you know, disseminate the information, share tools and know-how and work compared to what you mentioned about Clifton Ralph's upbringing, where if it was a tricky thing you were doing, you would try to shield it from the people around you because it was knowledge you had that increased your value and you didn't want it. The competitive thing is gone from the craft now, as near as I can tell, because everyone I've met, met and it's part, of the, it's part of the mission statement of the Northwest Blacksmith Association, for one, is to share the craft. That has to be better, right? Yes, it is much better. Uh... When I learned, uh, first book I got on blacksmithing was called uh, Plain and Fancy Forging by yep. Schwarzkopf. Got that one. I had to go to Milwaukee to get a, that, uh, that book. I could not leave the library with the book. I had to read it in the library. Wow. Okay. So 10, 20 years later, people were reproducing those books and there was a banner and uh, I think that was a big part of the spirit and elan of the early going was when it was hard to get the knowledge. Uh, you know, you were forced to be in a position to be more sharing and yeah, it's, it's still pretty good. What, what I found 90% of the people that are doing blacksmith work do it for a hobby. Yes. And when you get right down to it, it's hot, dirty work. And, you yeah, know, I mean, right. it's just not for everyone. That's uh, right. So, you know, there's one thing to make a leaf and a key ring, and there's another thing to make a thousand leaves for a big gate. Yeah, and, for sure. Um, and then the whole business thing, you know, it doesn't matter if it takes 20 minutes to make a leaf when you're a hobby blacksmith. Yeah. When you have a bid and estimated job, it makes a difference. Yeah. You got to, you know, kind of, in your thinking, how long is it going to take to make this? You better be right or else you're going backwards. And I was the sort of person that if I came up short on the job, I did not kind of ease off on the quality of the work. I mm -hmm. had a personal, that was one of Francis's uh, 
sayings you got to please the customer but you also have to please yourself yes and yes. uh i did not like that you know putting in 25 percent more than what i had been on the job uh to get it finished um uh, i never went back to a customer and asked for more money yeah uh, so the business part was was not the fun part for me you know daryl nelson shared a quote from francis whitaker that i think i'll get about right that he said um do not give the customer anything they didn't pay for because it is a bad precedent. <laughs> and, okay. And, and then the other colloquialism from him that I have is let no iron go unworked. And I mean, exactly. he, he had, he had a gift for, he had a gift for sort of boiling these things down to a, a, a memorable piece of instruction. Didn't he? He, he was, he was uh, a, a, an impressive man who really influenced a lot of people in a good way. Yeah. 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 And he was very severe, very stern. And his wife was like a jokester, huh. loved to tell dirty stories uh -huh. and, and, and was a really, really lively, fun lady. So that was an interesting uh, contrast and, and it kind of softened him a lot yeah. to know that, you know, that she was so appealing to him that, you know, and yeah. they were just totally lovey-dovey. It was it was very sweet. You know, yeah. our, our our wives can have that effect on us, right? I mean, yeah. sort of. Yeah, tempering. Yeah, com yeah compromise. Uh, compromise. Um, compensate for weaknesses and yeah, and uh, and enhance strengths. All right, so so that's really great, and and we could mine this for a long time because of your firsthand experience with these guys, and frankly, I intend to. Because once they're gone, right, that their their wisdom was only available through the people that knew them. So we'll do this some more. But let's let's circle back to sawmilling a little bit. This is a sort of an arcane and obscure thing that you and I have shared an interest in. And we've both tried to make a living with a sawmill at one time or another. And you started out, you put together a circle mill. What was mm -hmm. the diameter on the saw? 48. 48, 48 inch. If you see me step away, Bob, don't let that distract you i'm i'm going to be in and out a little bit but you guys just keep doing okay. your thing i'm not sure if my camera okay. will show you or not but um okay. as you were how big was your bill it was a question right yeah 48 inch and saw it was a 40 48 inch saw uh i was a little underpowered okay first of all uh, yeah. first let me ask you this how much rim speed were you shooting for uh it was about 550 I, there was a part of the university of wisconsin uh, uh, Forest Products Laboratory. Oh my! The kind of a USDA University conglomeration, and there was a lot of pamphlets put out, and they had a man who would go and troubleshoot sawmills. His name was Stanford Lundstrom. Oh, I would be a much younger man now if I would have had that resource when I tried to build a sawmill. It brought years put, of my he life. Put out a, a brochure. It was called a Small Sawmill Holy Owners uh, Manual. And uh, I was having a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble yeah. getting going. It's hard. And, and it's hard. And um, what was interesting, what, what I would, the, my problem was I was underpowered. Yep. How much and power did you have? 75 horsepower. That, that was underpowered for sure. It was underpowered. And you know what he had me do? What? I took out every, every other, other tooth. tooth, skip tooth, turn it into a skip tooth. And, and but kept the shanks in. So uh -huh. I had yep. my, tension. tension. Yeah. Um, and, and it helped. It, it helped. What, well, what it, what it did, it took. Uh, instead of making sawdust, I made kernels. Yep, and that's what you got to make quarter inch chunk kernels. And as yeah. soon as that happened, and the 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 sawdust stayed with the, the the gullet in the saw and took it out, rather than spilling out on the sides and getting the, the saw hot, everything yes. went great from there. Yes. Yes. So that's so interesting because I had the same experience with my wife's granddad, Sam Ball. And, and the net effect of cutting, of turning it into a, as, of taking a half the teeth is you have twice as much horsepower on each tooth. And no, you, you, you would, you, you, you it, it just put a longer, I don't know exactly what it, it, it just somehow you, you, you could only travel so fast each yes. tooth had took the same power, whether it was a hundredth of an inch or a tenth of an inch of advance. Right. So he, he because I, I didn't have enough power to feed fast, 
I was making fine sawdust, but I could feed at that slower rate with every other tooth and get a thicker chip. So that, so that's interesting. So on a tall face, my understanding is that you would have more than one tooth in the cut at a time, right? I mean, oh, yeah. each oh, yeah. coming tooth is pulling. And so if yeah. you only have half as many teeth in the, in, in the cut, you know, the, the horsepower half is being power. Right. So, so you increase the power and you can increase the feed rate, but that's so interesting that you I identified didn't increase the feed rate. Oh, the you did not increase the, the feed same. rate. You kept the but, same but, feed rate. But because of less teeth, I got a, a, a thicker chip. Okay. Um, so that and was one of the ways what, that, that carried off when I got into machining. Oh, machine shop work is the same, same idea thing, that all of a sudden uh, you're looking uh, getting a lot of information from the chips. And yes. in machine shop work, is it blue? Is it yes. thick? Is it curled? The, things like that. So that, that was something that was a, a great lesson learned from this guy, Stanford Lundstrom. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I had similar experience. I ended up going back to filling every, every hole and I increased my horsepower and I got my lead right. And I, but it was one way that I, if I was starting to have trouble, I'd go over and grab a handful of sawdust. And if it wasn't kernel size, yeah. if it was just dust, if it was little shaving, if it was, if it was small, I knew that I had, that I had trouble. And the bigger the sawdust, the better it was run. Yeah. Well, and the I, straighter. Had mentor, I had a mentor when I was sawmilling, luckily. I, I, I told you in our last conversation that uh, my father died when I was 15 years old, and I have been very fortunate in my life to have met older men who are willing to have been mentors. Yeah. And uh, this man uh, was named Ted Saul, S-A-W-L-E, came from an old English family. And, and uh, he was a mentor, not just in helping me get the mill straightened out, but in the business aspect of sawmilling which is a cyclical market. Yeah, it's commodity. Sort of like uh, a cyclical commodity with about a 10-year cycle, rise and fall, that's tied into a lot of things. Um, um, but he said, Bob, don't get dollar signs in front of your eyes. Huh. You know, huh. don't keep buying, buying, buying more and more machinery. He got by with real little uh old re rebuilt stuff rather than yeah. new push button everything and he was so right because i got in when it was a climbing market and then it busted mm -hmm. and there were people in wisconsin who were getting less for their lumber than they paid for the logs yep yeah i'm familiar with that I and am familiar a, with that. A number of them just faded away. Uh, so I, I was what was called the wood, woodpecker sawmill, mm -hmm. just a little kind of neighborhood mill. Mm -hmm. In, in uh, economic geography, there's uh, the fact that the, the lower the price of the material, the, the heavier it is and the lower the value, the closer you got to sell it to your your. Mm -hmm. your market has to be consumer closed mm -hmm. so with a log you have the, the market is the lumber mm -hmm. and by sawing it you got rid of the slabs and the sawdust so it became lighter so it could be sold further away mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and um in the same for flour milling rock milling uh in in pre uh, automobile days towns were located about every five miles apart mm -hmm. and that was where you could go to town and back in a, in a horse and wagon and still be able to do your chores your farm chores so there mm -hmm. were these little towns about every five miles apart and most of them had a grain mill and uh, you know the sawmill for me i, I caught the tail end of um Small scale farming, uh, dairy farming here. Uh, barns needed repair. A lot of them were hand hewn beams, you know, so a uh, floor beam went bad and then somebody would need a, you know, a five by 14. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something you could not go to the lumber yard with. Custom you know, piece. Or, yep. Custom. Or a hay rack. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, for small bales, hay bales, you had these hay racks that, you know, person would ride and stack the bales mm -hmm. on and eventually got sides on it for kicker bales and all 
So I had a pretty good market for um, the the low grade lumber, mm-hmm. <clears throat> especially longer stuff. <clears throat> I did not want to log. Mm-hmm. Um, too much money involved in the trucks and the skidders and so on. Mm -hmm. We're in an area here of real high quality timber, hardwood. And uh, Dubuque, Iowa is a big concentration point for lumber and and logs because it tied into shipping water Mm -hmm. freight. Mm -hmm. So on both sides of the river, out about 75 miles the loggers ranged and i got tied up with a guy who was a veneer logger all he wanted was that butt cut that Mm -hmm. first eight ten feet of clear 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 big 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 and the top logs from those uh sales um were high quality a lot of them only had one defect and i could kind of nibble around the other three sides Mm -hmm. and take my time and get a high dollar value product that i could sell uh through the market that time Hard, um, so we're talking hardwood oak yeah, hickory yeah, gr- graded gr- graded okay five quarter were you selling five quarter mostly four quarter okay sell it net net four saw it for so it set it for uh inch and a uh, inch and an eighth finish yep. was what the, was what they were buying for four quarter so yes, i was yep. sawing uh, in, inch and three eighths yeah there you go it was Got my it. set Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I could saw about 2000 feet a day That's with good. some pickup off bearing two guys off bearing. I didn't have a live deck. Everything was rolling the logs by hand and, and, you know, pulling lumber by hand. I did have a forklift. So these were eight, eight and 10 foot lengths or longer, mostly mainly eights, uh-huh. eight, six. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and what, uh, I would sell through a broker in Milwaukee. Uh, when I got a load to send my load together, uh, I'd call them. They would send a truck. It would go to Milwaukee. And 10 days later, I would get a check. Just a second. So you would load that semi-trailer off of the ground by hand? No, load the tra- I, I, had a, I had a loader. A you had a loader. loader. Okay. I okay. would make, uh, I think I made 500 board foot packs. Okay. And, and just Banded it. That, that semi as, as much as I could. And I, I, the way I was set up, <clears throat> uh, the trucks never had to come in off the road. They could kind of pull onto the shoulder of the road and mm-hmm. my driveway came up to load them. So I didn't have to have a big yard and semis turning around. They kind of came and went. A lot of gravel under that. What, what, was, what was nice was that the broker uh, it was uh, net... 10 days net to, if they paid by 10 days, they took an extra 2% yeah. for their fee, of their that, broker fee. That's, and, that's, a, that's a good 2% uh, to spend, man. That's nice to have. Well, that they 10 never days. missed that date. That you bet. money came, that check came out. So that, then the logger uh, fronted me the logs. Okay. So I would pay him and I would pay my help and my running expenses through, um, that check from the broker and um then i would sell the slabs and the two common and under as farm lumber fencing Uh and you know whatever and there there were some longer logs that sure but the top logs didn't have the grade in it as the the, the lower ones and i had a nice little business it went Uh really the only problem was the winters here were pretty rough yeah and uh trying to handle frozen logs and lumber uh it was dangerous so i would go back to work at the blacksmith shop which was two miles away and uh in the winter time from about april through october i worked at the sawmill and then in the winter time went back to the blacksmith shop so that's a perfect life tremendous source of income was the slabs the firewood especially if we had a bad winter so, so let, me, let, let, me, over it. let me just tell you that what you described is a perfect life. Sawmill in the summer, blacksmith in the winter. That's yeah. a perfect life. So a couple more tech questions. Um, <clears throat> were there enough little peckerwood sawmills back there that there was a shop that would tension your saw blade? Could yes. you send your, okay. Yes. So were they yes. rolling the tension in or still hammering no, the tension hammering in? Up. They hammering were still, up. okay. 
And that so, was, you know, I would go up and watch, take my mm-hmm. blade up and watch. But I, for, for some reason or another, I probably only had in 10, 12 years of sawmilling there, I, I probably only needed my blade touched up uh, two times. Interesting. This um, guy set me up at the right speed, yeah. the right feed. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, just like on a chainsaw, you put a new set of teeth in, all your problems were Oh, gone. yeah. Yeah, you you're know? cutting again. You're cutting yeah. again. Did, did you ever fool around with swaging those teeth out to get some oh, more absolutely. curve out of it? Did absolutely. you? Absolutely. I, I, I sharpened it with a file and a well, hammer. But, yeah. but, but would you swedge them? Would you swedge yeah. them to reclaim width? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I never fooled that. I'd file them back till I was just having too much trouble. Oh, I'd no, throw them away. No, and put I, in I, I'd file them back to the little nubbin. I could keep those corners, you know, pushed Sharp, out that square. Um, did you, you were just running mild steel bits. You didn't do any chrome steel or stellite no, or anything. No, no, yeah. No. I, I filed no. by hand. I filed by hand too. And it's just so much faster. Um, so I was asking you that and that. Okay. Then so then what's the difference to, to what I'm running now? Yeah. Mill. So, so you're, you're running a wood miser now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's night and day difference. It's a completely different experience. It, does yours have a live deck? No. Okay. More's the pity, right? Those things are no, so nice. No, I'm, I'm not in business per se on that. I, I'm using a lot of the lumber for myself. I just built a little garage on homes on lumber. I just use it for the neighbors. I actually quit taking it out portable. Yeah. I was doing that for a while, but now I have them bring logs to me and it's, you know, three, four logs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something I enjoy doing, but what, what, um, I've gotten into making bowls and I can do a lot of blanking of material with the sawmill to make the blanks for my turnings. Yeah. So that that's the primary reason for having it now. Um, what happened in how I happened to get the thing in 08, the blacksmith business went to a complete standstill. The the, the recession, depression yeah. of 08 to, well, it almost lasted for the blacksmithing business and almost until 18. Uh. It was almost a 10-year downturn. Um, uh, I had a really good crew. I had two men who were extremely well-trained, loyal, hardworking Bl- in the blacksmith and shop. I didn't want to lay them off and I didn't want to cut their hours because I knew they had mortgage payments and car payments and so on. And so I left the business huh? for, for about three years. Uh, I mean, I participated in all, but I didn't draw rent. I didn't draw salary for three years. Mm. And how I survived, we had a 40 acre patch of woods and there was a small business near us that was buying uh, basswood. Basswood is... Uh, kind of a very clear, uh, even grained, uh, it's a hardwood, but it's the closest thing to like a pine that we had here. Right. And this business used it to make a hobby craft product. They would sell clock kits and I see. decoupage kits and wood burning and so on. And they, they bought in mass quantities. And they would buy it green? They, they would buy it green and rough? They would buy the logs. Oh, oh, I got it. You were just yeah, telling so, them logs. So I, I, hit, I, I and, and the <laughs> timber we had was real thick with basswood, just what they wanted. Oh, I got a purchase order and I started logging. Well, now I'm 65 years old when this is happening. Sure. And uh, 63, I guess. And um, had a real tough winter for wood, uh, for snow. Mm-hmm. And uh, boy, the first couple of weeks was tough. You know, big difference between yeah. when you're. 40 and in the woods to yeah. 60 and in the woods and it's Big hilly difference. here and uh pulling the chair i got a, a tractor with a, a little winch on the back and i'd pull the cable down and hook up and you know start you know climb back up the hill and pull the, the clutch and in the know, snow the the, the, the the turn when you're coming hit an old stump get stalled yeah. and have to climb back down back up and i well, uh, my wife decided she was going to help me <clears throat> and mm-hmm. she could set chokers and, and, you know, that really made a big difference you bet. and it, it was good. Well, when I would, deli- we, we could make one load a day, About I had a small straight truck. We could do about a thousand feet a day mm-hmm. and he was paying, I think, uh, 60 cents so a foot. Yeah, so we could make about cut, skid, load, deliver 
about uh, sixty six hundred dollars a day. Well, that's worth doing. En enough. To, it was worth doing. Uh, yeah. It kept us going here. It kept the shop going. And um, then when I was up there, I noticed they had a wood miser sawing, and they had a lot of natural edge product for. Hey, one second. Hold that spot. So you were were you shipping them short logs, eights, tens, twelve? Eight, Eight, six. Eight, six. Everything was eight six. Okay. Yeah, everything was eight six. And you could yeah. so you had one log length and you'd stack it up high enough to get a thousand yeah. board feet in the bunks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sixteen foot truck. And it, yeah. Got it. Um so um I you know asked him about this. And this guy says, Well, I'm pulling out. Uh I, I don't know, I remember why. And um a guy in the blacksmith club had bought a wood miser. He had three daughters and he, they all wanted to build houses. So mm -hmm. my friend bought this mill and they saw it and the houses were done and the mill was sitting kind of idle. And it, it kind of piqued my interest after, you know, having been in it before. Saw Millie. Yeah. And um, I borrowed it at first and eventually bought it from him. And I saw it up there pretty steady for about an, another two seasons. This had to be uh, winter work, uh, mm -hmm. basswood stains, oh. and they wanted it, and they wanted a bark on product. So the, the you had to wait until it really got cold. Sap went down, and then they ran. But as soon as warm weather showed up, they were done. So it was another one of these. So when the sap field. when the sap was up, it would stick or stain in the stack. You're saying, or what kind of stain are you seeking to? It would actually have blue stain. Okay, yeah, like it, like a pine. Yeah. You, you had it, you, you couldn't put it in a pack for more than a uh, couple of days. I see. I yeah. see. Okay. So uh, a, a sawing up at this place there, they had uh, sticker fixtures and stickers and they, they provided a guy to help off bear. And, and yeah, so it worked. And then what happened at the blacksmith shop, <clears throat> one of these men, uh, Terry Southers, uh, had been such a loyal employee and long-term employee that I had made an arrangement with him where he was kind of buying me out. Mm -hmm. He was 10 years younger than now. I, what the plan was when I turned 65, he would be 50% owner. And then we would keep it going, except he'd be in charge and, you know, start to buy me out. And I would have become the employee. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, suppose, you know, it all came to a halt in 08 when, you know, nothing was happening. It was so quiet. Uh, we would email ourselves to make sure the email was working. Wow. Wow. And we would phone ourselves to make sure the phone was working. Wow. So I, so I, we live in a commodity based economy back here too. And I've had those experiences when I moved out of here in 1981 to Wyoming unemployment here in Roseburg was 23%. So I, I have a, I have an idea and I wasn't in business per se then, but I, I understand what you're talking about. Those are depressing. Well, what times. happened when I was gone, everyone took a step up the ladder. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry was not really interested in selling and dealing with customers. He was interested in being the manager in the shop and the worker. Uh, another very fine craftsman, Dieter Wiegang, um, was Romanian, had a pretty strong accent. He didn't like talking on the phone and dealing with customers. He was a little embarrassed, I think, about his accent. Well, three years later go by, when I come back in, uh, Dieter's answering the phone. Terry's going out uh, selling, uh, you know, doing site surveying, laying jobs out. And they, they read the paper. They knew what was going on. They knew the sacrifice that I made. And after that, I tell you, every time I would try to do something out in the shop, you know, a little welding job or fix a job for a farmer, Dieter would come over and he says, "No, no, 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 no. I do, I do, I do, I do." Yeah, yeah. And um, it really made the transition to get out better. Only problem was now Terry was in his sixties. Yeah. And he says, well, why am I going to, you know, be buying you out? And I'm going to be in the same position you are in short order. Well, I thought I had a lot of leads. The business came back looking good on paper, fully complete outfitted shop tools and equipment, you know, and tooling, you know, real turnkey operation. 
and I ran ads in Abana and, and in Noma, and I called and you know touched base with everyone I could possibly think of. And I couldn't get somebody to pull a trigger. I had a few lookers, but nobody that would pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, another neighbor of mine had sold his business through a broker, business broker. He says, why don't you call Great Lakes? And I called them. Guy came out, looked things over. 45 days later, we closed. And he found a wonderful, wonderful young man to take over. Wow. And the shop is so thriving. And so business Peter, business Peter brokerage is there. Wow. Terry is happily retired. And so am I. And it really, really was a nice ending to a 52 year career. So the, the takeaway from that is that sometimes business brokerages earn their money, right? That worked out just right. It did. It was, wow. it was a big bite to swallow because they took 10% of everything, including sure. the real estate. Sure. But, but in the, in the rear view mirror, it was the right move. It, it, Terry and I were, were more than ready. Yeah. More than ready. And uh, you know, now somebody called, I had bid a job seven years ago. And uh, this woman kind of had put everything on hold and got into other issues and all. And she calls, she emails me the other day and, you know, I, I hope you remember me and why, you know, I haven't finished it. And all. I said, uh, well, um, why don't you call Ryan? There you go. The new owner. And it was so nice to not, you know, when you're a builder, you, 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 the project gets in your mind to the yep. point where you're dreaming about it yep. at night. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it I owns you. I don't, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't, have, don't have to, to make that. take on other people's prod problems. Yeah. And 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 you know, I got enough to take care yeah. of on my own. You don't have to that. solve, you don't have to solve other people's problems. Yeah. So so that that's a big thing. And when you're in a service, when you're a service provider, that's what you are signing up to do is solve other people's problems. So yeah. I have a couple <laughs> a couple of questions well, that have come one, up from one, this. One, one, one thing that tied us into Nate's question was, I, or yours, was I still blacksmithing? People are still calling me. <laughs> you know, sure. uh, you can, colleagues are calling sure. about, you know, what about this? What about that? I have, I enjoy that. People are still coming by to visit old friends, you know, who are in the area for mm -hmm. an art fair or something. So I haven't given up. I, I still sure. enjoy watching YouTube. And sure. um, I, I, I still beat on... <laughs> you know, stuff that, but it's all personal. And sometimes it's making a part for a lawnmower, my lawnmower, you know? So, so <laughs> that kind of, seg that, that kind of ties in a little bit to a question that I have, but before I ask that question, and the question I'm going to ask you is, do you advise young people to monetize their passions? Okay. So hold that in abeyance for just a second. Clifton Ralph, could he have forged an anvil if it, yes. and, and not with his hundred pound little giant? I know that, but he had, and he had seen, and he was, he was someone who could have for the right yes. incentive. He could have done. Yes. No, okay. No, no. Problem. And he, one of his demo pieces was a little steak anvil. That was incredible. If you, have you ever looked at his tapes? So I, I bought the DVD from him. I talked to his wife. This was eight or 10 years ago. And my wife, yeah. my life has been so busy since then. Okay. I never finished viewing them. And I, well, I am one I feel point, bad. I believe he shows making this little kind of steak anvil, maybe about four or five inches long with a inch tang to go into the hardy hole. And then there's a slot down the middle. So it's like sort of like a, a bending fork bick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it is a tapered horn on one end and a round horn on the other end and the slot down the middle and the whole thing is done for flat dies <laughs> wait a minute the whole thing is done on flat dies well with, with handheld tooling with, with, with top tools and, and a with, saddle with and tooling yeah. no kidding and that there's where you can see the genius of this man and figuring the tooling out and then the <laughs> the breakdown the, wow the, uh varf, varf. I, I, you know well yeah and and also the uh, I, <coughs> isolating distributing forge to finish size wow wow how interesting it I, I, if i had a time machine about my second or third stop would be back into hay buttons factory floor to watch them doing that making well, those when you pieces come out for a visit you're going to see something close yay except, yay except a hundred times bigger yeah and and of course that's intriguing but man it what wouldn't it have been nice to see the animals spilling off and set on their quenching table and the water coming yeah. down from the overhead pipe and and you know the balance between quench and residual heat to temper and all of that that's that's magic you know well it was a you know a long 
time continuity of knowledge and experience and that's what unfortunately america has lost the yeah. apprenticeship system where some guy would come in like yeah. francis you know either you know a sledgehammer or a broom or something and slowly with eyes open and mouth shut yeah. eyes and ears yeah. open and mouth shut yeah learn steal with your on. eyes yeah steal with your eyes uh, and, so you know, so, so when you when you had that experience in the 20th century of engaging with a thousand year old tradition of journeying from shop to shop, just quickly tell us what it was like to walk into a European shop, mostly in Britain, I think you said. Yes. You're walking yeah. in there. You had some sort of a phone introduction or something, and you walk in and you I, say, "Put me to work." Yes. I, I uh, wrote a letter to the British Artists Blacksmith Association magazine, sort of like the Anvil's mm -hmm. Ring, but in, mm -hmm. in, in England. And I got five reply explaining my intentions, and I got five replies back. <clears throat> and I started my trip uh, when they had their conference, and I filled in at that three or four day conference the rest of my itinerary. I wanted to kind of travel yes. in an orderly fashion. Yes. Started in the south, worked my way north, then back over and back down again. Um, some places were kind of old school where you had to prove yourself uh, at Richard Quinnell's shop in England, which was probably the biggest or nearly the biggest in the country uh, and had an international crew. Uh, I got set to filing some aluminum castings that were part of an ornamental grill work. Mm -hmm. And that was like a three or four day file, 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 file. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and after that, I was then invited to go out and site survey and, and do some layout and do this and do that. People opened up after that. In metric. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess so. Mm -hmm. um, other shops were, one guy would, had worked for American Bridge and Iron and had wound up in England and it was like a hobby blacksmith, but quite good. Um, another guy was a, a tool maker uh, and, and sold what was the remainder of the blacker power hammer business. Um, didn't really get a lot out of that stay, but it was interesting. Uh, I ran into a guy named Ken Miller who had a, shop that had uh, fabrication sheet metal and blacksmithing and he was trained as a blacksmith traditional uh, what i got from him uh, he had enough equipment and a variety of work that he worked eight hours a day and went home and had a nice life uh, some of the people who were on the cover of the magazine the the trendsetters there was a uh, move to very contemporary work yeah. New Iron Age. Um, most of those people, or let's say some of them, were struggling financially. Um, they would not take a fire basket or a little window grill or something traditional gate hardware or repair job. They were they were more going for the art market. Yeah, um, a couple of them made it and were doing well, but a couple of them were uh, struggling to the point they couldn't afford to have me there to work for nothing. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. couldn't afford the, the food, the extra mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. uh, then I met uh, somebody uh, named Brian Russell, who I felt was my alter ego, mm -hmm. tall, dark haired. I, I used to have dark hair. I can see and, it. A uh, <laughs> uh, shop out in a little country village, um, did repair work. Uh, it was very artistic. And, um, as you know 40 some years later uh really gotten to the top recognition in, in uk now very sculptural and and but all traditionally uh done uh what was his many, name as far as the craft part of it uh i met a guy who had a well, 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 one, dealer. one second what was his name the fellow you were just brian, talking about brian russell did, do you know, does he have a piece in that 150 millimeter challenge? That, Probably. Yeah, I, Probably. I think I recognize that name from one of those stunning little accomplishments. Yeah. His, I think uh, I recognize that. 
what's is it called? Uh, Little Newsham Forge. I, th I think I, I would check just that, about check out his website. You'll see yeah. some spectacular design and execution. Yeah, and I he think has he's, a son I think he's come into the business. So that that's really kind of nice. And I, you know, I keep up with some of these people, you know, three, four times a year. Yeah. Then yeah. I met a man um, who uh, was about a fifth generation uh, Scottish blacksmith, um, had a Ford tractor dealership. And he also manufactured some trenching digging equipment uh, for um, drainage mm -hmm. pipe. Very successful man, very influential in his village. Uh, and he was a fabulous uh, uh, hand crafting, you know, well, he, he got into a pissing contest with somebody in, uh, in uh, Baba, the British Artist Blacksmith Association. Oh, yeah. Who was saying, "Oh, you, you know, why are you, uh, why are you uh, fire welding?" He says, "Well, I can fire weld faster than you can MIG weld." Uh -huh. I says, "No, you can't." He says, "Well, I got to." So, well, let's do this. We'll take ten pieces of three quarter inch square material, and you make ten welds, and let's see who gets them done faster. And this guy beat the guy with a MIG welder. Beat the guy with welding. the MIG. Wow. Fire welding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Um, so it was, you know, a really, I, I read something about when you're an apprentice, keep your eyes open and your mouth shut and, you know, it's just stay busy. And the easiest way to stay busy is pick up a broom. Yeah. Sweep. Or un sweep. unload a truck, yep. you know, do yep. that kind of work. And as soon as people saw that I was willing to do that. And then when they would set me on a task that I, had some skill you know and was contributing and i wasn't asking for anything but that i think i went over there with uh you know around a thousand dollars for my expenses for this three-month trip i think i came back with seven hundred dollars there you go yeah you earned your key and, and the only money i spent was like buying stuff to send back home to my kids <laughs> and whatnot and uh, that's neat uh, what an experience it was it was fantastic what and, an experience! We'll have these people as friends and colleagues, and yeah, yeah. That was that was a watershed thing. So to kind of wrap this up, and right on the heels of of that experience, would you advise young people today to try to monetize their passion? Absolutely. Would you? Absolutely. If you can be one person twenty four hours a day, you're going to be happy. Yeah. And uh, it's not an easy path, but it it also is you know you you become a skilled tradesman they're, they're not going to send that job to china that's right that's right you know there might be competition in the market but you know if you're a plumber they're not going to send that job to china yeah they're never going to 3d print drain systems yeah yeah they never will let me answer a little further on that question um i had a lot of people come uh high school grade school kids come to for a tour of the shop and what I saw was in a group of 20 people, there was a two or three that you could see were ADD or whatever it's called, you know, kind of restless and all. Mm -hmm. And I, what I could see is they did not want to learn to sit behind a computer all day. Mm -hmm. they, they wanted to be more physical up on their feet doing stuff. Those are the people I would definitely urge towards um, learning a trade. The question is, are they going to love it? I, I don't know. You know that's something that's about, what I'm driving at. Yeah, go There's ahead. something about the blacksmith thing and the fire that is intriguing. It seems like everyone. I mean, yeah. a few people are afraid, but most people seem to be drawn to it. So there's something unique about it. Um, and the reality is, as a, as a tradesman, you know, you're going to make between what, fifty, hundred thousand dollars a year, yeah. something like that. You know, yeah. Yeah. you're not going to have a second house mm -mm. and two snowmobiles mm -mm. and a ski boat and an ATV and three cars. You know, so if you kind of have realistic expectations, it can be great. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to be like everyone else, you might feel a little. Uh, left behind mm -hmm. so um but for some people 
absolutely. Uh, you know, I have a dozen colleagues, you know, people of my generation that have had really nice, interesting lives being a self-employed craftsman and uh, have made enough money. I'm, I'm not wealthy, but I'm comfortable mm -hmm. and um, we've gotten recognition, um, had a chance to travel. Uh, what I like is to drive past the house and there's a railing up that we did 25, 35 years ago and it's still looking good. You know, I, I can mark my life by um, real concrete, uh, yep. m you know, things that I can see and touch and all. I really like that. And then uh, sawmilling and stuff, it's just something really fascinating about it the woodworking, the material itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I feel very grateful, very lucky, the life I've led and still, you know, got a ways to go yet, I guess. So yep. You know, yep. That, that's nice. Well, too. I know you have a, a YouTube channel and there's a little, little video with Clifton Duncan on there. If I'm got his name correct. And is there anywhere besides Clifton there? Ralph, Clifton oh, Ralph. Ralph. Ralph Clifton Duncan is a great Twitter follow. Uh, anyways, yeah. um, Clifton Ralph, um, is there anywhere besides there that people who are really wanting to chat with you or need help or have a, whatever can get in touch with you or get a hold of you or follow you? And then, and then I'll give you, you know, what any last words um, from there? I but. would say, you know, I'm probably it could be found on Google, you know, and uh, um, yeah, um, people do kind of get these calls from nowhere. Um, mm -hmm. a lot of it was people hunting for the industrial power hammers. Yeah. And that yeah. was something we, we didn't talk about, you know, when I said that Francis had this sort of minimal thing, if you're going to make a living blacksmithing, you have to have a power hammer. You've got to have a power it's hammer. Just, yeah. And the difference between a home built hammer, a little giant, to something like a Chambersburg or a Nazel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many yeah. people I had come through and tried out the the three hundred pound uh, Nazel we have. And it's like this look on their face. It's very user friendly. It's yeah. very gentle and controllable. But then when you need the power, it's there. Yeah, yeah. And you just to see people ease up. And all of a sudden, they're not even thinking about the hammer anymore. They're shaping metal with it. And the uh, ability to use handheld tooling, you know, on flat dies gives you so much versatility. And it, it takes it back to like having a striker. Yes. And, and uh, at the, you know, on the other side of the anvil from you. Yeah. Uh, a helper. So when, when there I, were limited amounts of these, then uh, people really been on the hunt for them. And the fact that we rebuilt them and made parts and so on, that, that was a, the bulk of the questions that, you know, we got sort of towards the end there. Quite sure. Uh, I don't know who else is doing it. Uh, I think Ryan is still accepting that kind of work. And Dieter is still there who did most of the work and, and you know, knows where all the tooling is and so on. Hmm. Um, so I guess that's there. And, you know, you know they're filled, fill, they fill, and tell anyone, feel free to call Postville Blacksmith Shop and talk to Ryan. He's a really sharp young man who yeah. I think is going to be a major player in, in, the, in the game if he doesn't get distracted into uh, manufacturing. Yeah. He came out of a manufacturing background and I have a feeling that he's going to invent something or find a market for something that's going to take him in a different direction. But interesting. He's very, very passionate about um, mountain bikes. And I, yeah. I always thought that's where he was going to, you know, come up with a new sprocket or a new something or another. And, mm -hmm. uh, but he is a very, very ambitious, talented young man. And uh, it's been a treat. To, to pass on what I did to him. And uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, that, that, I'm, that's, I'm available. Yeah. That, 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 that is, that is uh, sort of bringing something full circle in a way that not many guys get to bring it full circle. You know, they build a business and there's not enough blue sky to sell and nobody's interested and nobody's qualified and nobody has any money. And so it just peters out. 
but for you to have been able to buy that from someone who plied the craft there, ply the craft there in that location for 52 years, and then turn it over to someone who has all the capacity to continue for 40 or 50 more years, very uncommon. Very, I can't wait to come back. And, I can't wait to come back and, and see that with my eyes and, and have you or somebody yeah, show yeah. me some of the flat die tricks that, that I probably won't get off of Clifton Ralph's little DVD because it's so scratchy. Well, then check that uh, book, uh, Forging Practice Ill Illustrated. It takes a while to um, kind of figure it out because there's very little um, explanation. It's right. just pictures or drawings, but it, it was a great, great help to, cool. to, to understanding, you know, how to move metal. Clifton's thing was not how to make a leaf, not how to make a scroll. It was how to make anything. Yeah, that 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 your thought process uh, was the same on, yeah. on any metal object. That that was the big thing I got from him. Bob, thanks a million for taking the time out of two Fridays because of our trial <laughs> run last week to do this. And we might find it. We might put some of that up. The audio is great, but we had technical difficulties later. That goes into more detail about your. Uh, earlier background and such so anyways can't thank you enough and it'll be great to do this again at some point and we will link to that video like i said of that you did with clifton ralph on your channel because after hearing you talk about him i had to just type his name in and same with uh, francis whitaker just you got to put these faces to the names everyone so um do that when you get home if you're listening and bob thank you so much and uh looking forward to doing it again one of these days <laughs>